Hi. Hello. In chapter 16 of Genesis, Abram and Sarai have decided to do it their way. They have had the promises of God for something like 11 years already, and Abraham is now 86 years old. And the result of their doing it their way is a illegitimate son is born. But surprise, God takes care of the illegitimate son, even while saying that this is not the means by which he will bring about his promise. In chapter 17, we have God's means and God's schedule for bringing about the promise. Okay. So we'll read verses 1 to 8. All right. When Abram got to be 99 years old, then Jehovah appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and prove yourself faultless. And I will give my covenant between me and you that I may multiply you very, very much. At this, Abram fell upon his face, and God continued to speak with him, saying, As for me, look, my covenant is with you, and you will certainly become a father of a crowd of nations, and your name will not be called Abram anymore, and your name must become Abraham because a father of a crowd of nations I will make you. And I will make you very, very fruitful and will make you become nations and kings will come out of you. And I will carry out my covenant between me and you and your seed after you according to their generations for a covenant to time indefinite to prove myself God to you and to your seed after you. And I will give to you and to your seed after you the land of your alien residences, even the entire land of Canaan, for a possession to time indefinite. And I will prove myself God to them. Well, first things first, he's now 99 years old, so I, I suppose the <laughs> deliverance of the promise is seeming ever more remote. Mm. But this at this very time, Yahweh appears to him again. Mm -hmm. And you have that conjoining of the three ideas. God appears, God speaks, covenantally, promises, mm -hmm. and the name. He identifies himself, it is identified in verse 1, his, this being is identified as Yahweh. And yet, when he speaks, there's a new name for God. He, he says, I am God Almighty, literally in Hebrew, El Shaddai, mm. meaning God blesses in the context of covenant and is all sufficient for all needs. That seems to be what's built mm. into this idea of El Shaddai, God all sufficient. Mm. Now, we remember, if we've read Exodus, we remember the story of the Exodus is accompanied by God himself saying to Moses, by my name Jehovah, I did not make myself known to your ancestors. Yeah. But it's very plain from the Genesis account that he has made himself known yeah. by the name Yahweh, even in appearing. But of course, the, the verb to know in Hebrew is far more rich than it is in English. Yeah. It doesn't mean knowing the syllables. Yeah, it's like uh, when it says he knew his wife. You know, it doesn't mean, oh, he's acquainted with her, right? Like, it means intimacy. he's got an intimacy with her. Yeah. So, with God as well, that intimacy grows with time as they see God doing more, more, more activity on their behalf and in, in the world. So, it should grow. But in the patriarchal period, which after all is about 400 years long, that intimacy is not there most of the time. So when God says, I made myself name, known by the name God Almighty, El Shaddai, and I didn't make myself known by the name Yahweh, we see the intimacy with which at least Abraham walked with God and Isaac walked with mm -hmm. God and, and then Jacob partly, uh, not much of the time apparently. Mm -hmm. That is all gone when they get to Egypt. So by that time, Yahweh needs to reestablish mm -hmm. his identity as the true God, as the famous text we use as a Jehovah's Witness in Exodus 9 where where God says to Moses to tell Pharaoh for this cause I have raised you up that my name Yahweh may be 
made known throughout mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Th the world. But here... And during, during times of struggle, God does seem more distant to you. Yeah. You know, even if it's not true, that does seem to be the way it is, you know. You don't feel the intimacy. Yeah. And in this particular instance, of course, God is seeming distant from even Abraham because the promise has not yet been fulfilled. We're 24 years now into the promises. Mm -hmm. But his response, nevertheless, is Abraham falls on his face and God says to him, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. Now the, mm -hmm. the original promise that through him a great nation would be created is now amplified into a crowd of nations in the New World Translation, yeah. mm -hmm. or a multitude in most other modern Bibles, and your name will no longer be Abram, mm -hmm. but a name that actually means father of multitude, Abraham. Right. Right. A multitude of nations, and those nations, no, it's noteworthy, are not blessed necessarily spiritually. That is, they're not nations that are, are somehow directly connected with the promise yeah, of a it, seed that will rescue all yeah. the Gentiles. Going back to the original promise in chapter 12, he, he promises that his children, all his children, will be blessed. And, and people will be blessed for blessing. So, it, but it doesn't mean they all have the exact same blessings. Spiritual blessings, especially the, mm -hmm. the prophetic blessings of uh, a spiritual deliverer or Messiah. Mm -hmm. But it's made plain what the blessings are. Fruitfulness and material blessings mm -hmm. and even kings coming forth. We might apply that if, if we're just improvising to the kings that would come through the line of David, descended from Jacob. But there's kings, as we find out later, in the other lines coming from Abraham too because mm -hmm. several of the nations which come from Abram are actually kingdoms before Israel is delivered from from Egypt. Right. And in verse 8, this covenant, this everlasting covenant, is concerned with the land, mm -hmm. which is explicitly said to be an everlasting possession to Abram's offspring. And this is very interesting mm -hmm. that even today, the Holy Land is fought over between two, two tribes who claim to be descended from Abraham. Yeah, right. They're still there, fighting it out. Mm -hmm. But it ends with, I will prove myself God to them. God's being a promise keeper is part of the way he, he helps people to identify him, to be able to see what kind of God he is. So, you know, if you're going to proclaim something about God, his character is, uh, is evident from the fact that he keeps his promises. And the sign of the covenant is the subject of the next few verses after that, down to verse 14, where it's made explicit that any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. So the separation between Abraham's offspring and all the other nations is made very clear. This is the, the sign or the seal of it. But then you have the explicit details as to the birth of the seed of promise, mm -hmm. who will be called Isaac. So. Let us read from 15 down to 21. Okay. And God went on to say to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you must not call her Sarai, because Sarah is her name. And I will bless her, and also give you a son from her. And I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. At this Abraham fell upon his face and began to laugh and to say in his heart, Will a man a hundred years old have a child born? And will Sarah, yes, will a woman ninety years old give birth? After that Abraham said to the true God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. To this God said, Sarah your wife is indeed bearing you a son, and you must call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for a covenant to time indefinite, to his seed after him. But as regards Ishmael, I have heard you. Look, I will bless him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him very, very much. He will certainly produce twelve chieftains, and I will make him become a great nation. 
However, my covenant I shall establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this appointed time next year. Sarah's name is now Sarah, not Sarai. Apparently both these words mean princess, but the amplification of the blessing and the yeah. explicit promise that not only not only shall she bear the seed of promise, but she will also have nations, nations, plural, come out of her, and kings, plural. Mm -hmm. And the way this works out is that the nations coming through, not just Ishmael, already born, but through Isaac and one of his other sons, that's not the seed of promise, the firstborn es Esau, who loses this, the covenant promise. The birthright. N yeah. The birthright. Nevertheless, he has material blessings even before Israel, who mm -hmm. are still in Egypt. As we remember back in 15, yeah. we pass right by the passage where Abraham has a dark vision in which in, he is told that his sons, not yet born, will have to go down into a land not their own and dwell there in slave for 400 years. Yeah. So and that's all happening yeah. while the material blessings are falling on the other lines coming mm -hmm. from Abraham. Right. Including Edom. Yeah, and I think it's noteworthy that later we, we hear about Sarah laughing, but here you've got Abraham laughing, and I think when you read the two together, you see Abraham's laugh is more one of absolute joy, whereas Sarah's is, is of doubt. Yeah, that's a very interesting distinction. Mm. Mm -hmm. There's one last thought in this chapter, though, that leads us naturally into chapter 18, the wonders of chapter 18, and that is verse 22. Yes. With that, God finished speaking with him and went up from Abraham. Even in the New World Translation, mm -hmm. God went up from Abraham. So the habitual mental flip-flop that you do switch, or yeah. back, back backflip that you do when you're a Jehovah's Witness, and I would say Christians tend to do this too, mm -hmm. is you, you see the name Yahweh in here. Yahweh appeared, and you immediately go to an angel of Yahweh is appearing. Yeah, you read into it what you already think. But verse mm -hmm. 22, even in the New World Translation, plainly says God went up from Abraham. Mm -hmm. There was something before him, somebody before him, and that entity doesn't just poof disappear. Yeah, he ascends. So, I, I, just to um, to emphasize that we're going through uh, not absolutely verse by verse through Genesis, but we're kind of highlighting things that struck us when we were reading it for the first time after leaving the witnesses. Things that we hadn't really paid attention to or noticed before. Yeah. The next few verses are the detail of how Abraham immediately installed this commandment in his household, and Ishmael and all the rest of the men of the household are circumcised. Right. So he obeys the terms of the covenant, which leads us to something that apparently happens right after, because back in verse 20... I have heard you, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. All of that about Ishmael, but he's yeah. already said that it will happen next year that the yeah. seed of 21. promise shall be shall be born. Verse 21. Mm -hmm. At this time next year. So by the time we get to chapter 18, apparently not long after that, something else happens yeah. which is even more amazing if you're a Jehovah's Witness mm -hmm. than what has happened already in the book of Genesis. So, in the next segment, is anything too extraordinary for Jehovah? Mm -hmm.